Let's just take a moment to thank our loving God for being with us today and pray for our weekend. Loving God, we thank you for gathering us here today from all parts of the United Kingdom and beyond. And we thank you for our friends beyond on Zoom. We pray your wisdom to guide us this weekend. May we be inspired, challenged and encouraged. May we be brought to work together to reform our church so that all may flourish and thrive. We ask that you would give us listening hearts, loving compassion and wise words. We pray and give thanks for those speakers who will share their stories and their journeys with us. And we pray particularly for those who are still travelling to be with us, for safety, for them. Guide us all and surround us with your love and be with us. Amen. 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 Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. And welcoming Mary Varley to take the seat. Thank you so much, Catherine. Over to you, Mary. Catherine, thank you. That was a really lovely prayer. Thank you. Well, hello, Roots and Branches. <laughs> a huge welcome to everyone online and live in Leeds. We're delighted to have you with us. Welcome as well to our friends who hope to be with us but can't now join us. Just want to say a few personal words about the weekend. I hope that we'll find some spiritual magic in being together, in listening deeply to each other and creating and strengthening relationships, which we know must be at the heart of an emerging church. Being here brings to mind Charles Peggy's words in our Root and Branch prayer. I just love these words. It's my dream you dream, my house you build, my caring you witness, my love you share, and that is the heart of the matter. And for me, that says it all. I want to start with some words of thanks to some very special people. A very warm welcome and huge thanks to Penny Brown and Ruth G, who are with us at this moment in the room, and to Tony Flannery, who is somewhere between Dublin and Leeds. We know not quite where, but he, hopefully he'll be with us before the end of the evening. We're really looking forward, Penny and Ruth, to what you're going to tell us. And also here tonight, and sharing your stories with us, Lisa Loveridge and Tony Cassidy, Angela Hanley, Catherine Salmon, Jeffrey Brom Thompson, and Rihanna from our core team. Morag Liebert will join us tomorrow by Zoom. Right, some more thanks, Nick and Spike and Martin. Thank you so much for stepping in to help us with the technology. Now, we're going to be lending a hand here and there. So do forgive us if we're occasionally less than perfect. A big thank you to everyone who's given so generously to us since 2021. Many of you are with us online or in person. Thank you so much. Without your support, there would be no root and branch. Thanks also to everyone who's recently donated to us. And without you, we couldn't be here tonight either. A big thank you to our sponsors, the Passionist Movement and the Movement for Married Clergy. Without your sponsorship, Hinsley Hall could not have happened either. We're delighted that to oh, ah she's there. Penelope Middlebow, please give us a wave. Thank you. Um, Penelope was a founder member of Root and Branch, and she's going to be writing a blog for a tablet. So she might want to talk to you about your experiences this weekend. And that 
also includes our online friends. Right, so having had some introductions and welcome, it's time for you to talk to each other. My hope for this weekend is that we're going to strengthen and deepen our relationships with each other. And I'm wondering what you all hope for too. So why not introduce yourself to two or three of the people sitting around you and just share one hope that you've got for the weekend. People online, please share your hopes with us in the chat over the next five minutes. So over to you. Okay, everyone, it's time to stop talking now. Um, can I just say that we've got a good old fashioned flip chart there. And if you'd like to put some words of hope on that flip chart at some point, we'd be delighted. We'll come back to them on Sunday morning. Okay, right, moving on. I just want to say a few words about Mike Curry, chair of the Movement for Married Clergy, or EMAC. And earlier this year, they decided that they would join forces with Root and Branch. We're delighted to welcome you, Mike, and we thank you for the trust that you've placed in us. So over to you, Mike. Right, thank you, Mary. You've taken away my first paragraph. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, I was the chair of the movement for married clergy, and uh, we have decided to disband as a formal organisation and uh, give what support we can to Root and Branch, and uh, we're very happy to do that. Um, but just to, uh, I think I'll tell you a little bit of how we got to this point. Um, it's encouraging in some ways, but not so much in others. The movement was established in the mid-1970s when Catholics, and priests in particular, were hopeful for change. That hope included change to the rule of mandatory celibacy for priests. Vatican II had declared that celibacy is, quote, not demanded by the very nature of priesthood, and so some relaxation was expected. Certainly, as a seminarian at the time of the Council, I had expected this. But that change didn't come. More and more priests were starting to leave active ministry. Um, several thousand, indeed, have left in these aisles since then. So the movement of married clergy was established, including a lot of priests and former priests or former formerly active priests, um, to argue on both theological and practical grounds that the church should ordain suitable married men. The bishops of England and Wales didn't listen, and they haven't listened ever since. And since then, of course, things have only got worse. Vocations have all but dried up. In the 70s, already, there were only half of what they'd been 10 years before, but still about 100 a year. Now it's about 20 in England and Wales. True, the situation was a little mitigated by the arrival of several hundred former Anglican priests. Yeah. And of course, some of those were married. People in the pews accepted them readily, depending on their views. But anyway, you would think that the English bishops then would have thought, we have, uh, we have the experience of married priests, we should do something. No, they didn't. So now, most priests who are still active, whether homegrown or convert, are old. The average age is over 70, and most of those will be retiring soon. In 2015, my diocese, Hexham in Newcastle, had about 150 active priests. By 2030, an optimistic estimate is fewer than half of that and most of those will be active but past the normal retirement age. Our hierarchy's only response is to amalgamate parishes. 
In my neck of the woods, for example, in Whitley Bay in uh, the northeast, what used to be seven parishes are now looked after by two priests. And among the risks of celibacy, loneliness in old age is increasingly recognized as significant. Virtually all our diocesan and priests who might have expected to be living with other priests, not as hermits, now do live as hermits. Meanwhile, the views of ordinary Catholics have changed. While ordaining married men might seem quite might have seemed quite a logic, quite a radical uh, suggestion back in the 70s, it's a no-brainer for the vast majority of people now, young or old. And many cannot see why women, single or married, should not be ordained, or even why we need a clerical caste at all. Okay. Even so, our now modest-seeming campaign has made little headway in its nearly 50 years of existence. And we campaigners are growing old, less able to keep fighting. So we look for a broader, younger, and more vigorous reform body within which those of us who might still be able to continue to argue could help. Root and Branch was the obvious place to go, and Root and Branch very graciously accepted us. So hopefully you'll find us, former members of the former Movement for Married Clergy, but as individuals now, still speaking up uh, on the shared ministry page of the Root and Branch website. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. As you said, it's a no-brainer. <laughs> okay, now I'm just going to say a few words about our next four speakers. you find that they've got much fuller biographies in the back of the programme. So, fasten your seatbelts for a carbon-free world tour <laughs> to meet some of our international community. Okay, first off, we're going to India to listen to Virginia Saldana. Virginia is a noted feminist theologian. She's a speaker and an activist, and she's worked tirelessly to bring the crimes of clerical sexual abuse to light. Virginia. A program like Empowering Ourselves, Flourish and Thrive, is necessary to energize women and empower them to bring about change. In the past week, we in India have been shaken by the news of the brutal rape and murder of a young intern doctor while on duty in a government hospital. This chilling violence has spurned strong protests by women. Men too have joined in to demand justice for the 31-year-old female doctor, as well as for the creation of laws to ensure safety for doctors. The post-mortem report that was publicized has sent shivers down the spine of every person. And we ask, can one human being do such violence to another? This incident has generated so much anger and energy that change has to come about. However, when we hear of a rape of women by clergy in the church and all the violence that has taken place in the past, there's silence. There may be a few whispers, but these are soon quelled because patriarchy triumphs. Women's rights in the church are unheard of. Down the ages, the Catholic Church has been guilty of gross human rights violations against women's humanity and dignity. A few women speaking up has helped us gain a few rights, but every time the church gave women any inch like installing female altar girls, lectors, and Eucharistic ministers. It pats itself on the back. But that is not enough. Until the structures of patriarchy and hierarchy are demolished, our rights and dignity are shortchanged. Events like this are really important to energize women and empower them to speak up and demand 
full equality with men in the church. Women should not rest until we achieve equality. Well, we appreciate Virginia's clear and uncompromising stand and her ability to tell it as it is. And she reminded us that we mustn't rest until we achieve equality. And I say amen to that. Yes, yes. Okay, now we're going to move south and east now. So travel across a couple of oceans and we're in Australia. And we're going to meet Kevin Liston. Uh, I think Kevin might actually be online watching at this moment. Um, he's the chair of the Australian Coalition for Catholic Church Reform. He's passionate about promoting lay people's involvement in the church at all levels. And he gets up at about half past four to listen to our talks. <laughs> so over to you, Kevin. Greetings from Australasia. Congratulations to everyone at Root and Branch for bringing together such a wonderful group of speakers and participants for this event. And what a wonderful title you have, Empowering Ourselves, Flourish and Thrive. It immediately brings to mind two gospel sayings that sum up what Jesus set out to achieve. In Luke, I have come to proclaim liberty to captives, to liberate people. In John, I have come that they may have life, life to the full. First, Luke's expression, I have come to liberate people. That's us. Jesus wants us to throw off and discard anything that inhibits growth and flourishing. This does not mean that we avoid suffering or hard times, but that we work to change them. Look for a better world, not by ignoring problems, but by facing them and creating a future where we all flourish and thrive. Marianne Williamson says, Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate, but that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that frightens us. The Catholic Church community is on the verge of a major breakthrough into light, into recognizing the equality of women and men, but many are still captive and fearful. The dark, sinful misogyny at the heart of our structures and processes makes captives of everyone. This must and will change. Until the scandal of sexual superiority of men is eliminated, we are all tainted by bondage whether to the manipulation and repression of formal structures or to the blind spot of fear and insecurity that maintains the status quo. Bruton Branch is at the forefront of the movement to overcome this evil and give us all the freedom to flourish and so proclaim the glory of God that is in everyone. For this, we are grateful. And the second point, I have come that people may have life to the full. There is in each of us a sense of what it means to be human. It is in our instinct for authenticity and a good conscience. It provides an inner compass to guide us through life. In spiritual terms, it is the sense of faith. Too often we allow ourselves to be shackled by fear, our outdated structures and practices. But once blessed with the freedom, interior and external, to nourish and grow our sense of faith, we are open to a flourishing and fullness hitherto beyond our reach, or even sometimes beyond our imagination. This is not some utopian dream, but everyday living characterized by qualities such as love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness and self-control. These qualities are often called the signs of the Spirit. The kingdom of God is here, now. This same spirit of faith, hope and love is bringing people together, ordinary Catholics, as never before in small and large groups and gatherings such as this, in webinars and online conversations. The Spirit is moving in the world. We just need to recognize it. 
Many of us Catholics are now discovering a personal faith in new ways. We are discovering the spirit in our hearts, and so, freedom and fullness of life. Thank you, Root and Branch, for your work in bringing this about. And we wish you a successful and inspiring weekend. Good night. Thank you, Kevin. And we're reminded too just how much work you're doing down under in Australia to make the church the church that we want it to be. And yes, we are powerful, aren't we, beyond measure? And God's kingdom is here, and it is now. Right, okay, now we're going to move swiftly across the Tasman Sea, if you're still following the geography, and we're going to Aotearoa, New Zealand, to hear from Christina Raymer from Be The Church. Christina tells us that her mission is to bring about gender equality in the Catholic Church, and she's very committed to taking account of local cultures in a worldwide context. Context, And I think I did see Christina on the screen. Okay, thank you. Tēnā koto katoa. Greetings to all of you from Aotearoa, New Zealand. My name is Christina Raymer, and I'm a member of the Be The Change Aotearoa, New Zealand, an inclusive group of women and men who stand for gender equality in the Catholic Church. We endeavour to live out our calling in how we work, relate to one another in our day-to-day -day lives. We follow in the tradition of our forebears, most notably Kate Shepherd, who led us over 125 years ago to be the first country in the world to give women the vote. And more recently, Dame Fina Cooper, who led us in a Māori hikoi, a march to Parliament in the mid-1970s that launched, launched the Māori Renaissance and the beginning of our journey of undoing 200 years of colonisation. There are many others. Since the 1990s, we have had three women Prime Ministers, several women Governors General, a Chief Justice and numerous other women in significant roles in leadership in our small nation. We are yet to see a woman priest or bishop in the Catholic Church, and are envious of our Anglican sisters and brothers and other churches for their women leaders and ministers. We at Be The Change submitted a considered response to the call to become a synodal church, an open, inclusive and listening church, affirming the primacy of our baptism as the foundation of our equality as human beings created in the image of God. We are also conscious of our obligations as treaty partners to Tangata Whenua, the indigenous people of Aotearoa, New Zealand, who were here first and have welcomed us to this land. We embrace their vision of the interconnectedness of all creation, all peoples and all time, past, present and future. So we are delighted and inspired to be part of this initiative by Root and Branch to empower ourselves to build communities globally, to flourish and thrive by building the connections between our communities that enrich us all. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Now, you remind us about the generosity of the Maori people, the people of the land, and their interconnectedness of all creation. And you remind us as well that we look forward to the day when we have... 65% women cardinals, some of whom will be ordained, and we're on to our fourth female pope. <laughs> okay, now we're coming to the end of our world tour. We've zoomed across the Pacific now, we've jumped on a train to Minnesota in the USA, and we're going to meet Sue Bittany. Sue's been with us from our beginnings in 2020. And amazingly, she finds time to come to all our meetings as well. And I'm pretty sure she's here online with us tonight. Welcome, sisters and brothers, to the 2024 gathering at Hinsley Hall in Leeds from Root and Branch, Empowering Ourselves, Flourish and Thrive. I have been fortunate enough to be with Root and Branch since 2020, when a friend of mine, a priest friend of mine from the United States said, I think I know of a group where you can bring your soul and you will be refreshed. 
and nourished and challenged. And he told me about Root and Branch, what he knew. And so then I went online, discovered Root and Branch, and I've never left, and I never will. It is a place where we can gather together as friends, where we can gather together in faith to share who we are and what we believe in a safe place with other people who challenge us sometimes, but love us always. And that's what we're called to do. Love one another unconditionally, without exception. So welcome to Hinsley Hall in Leeds with the wonderful Root and Branch group for empowering ourselves, flourish and thrive, because you know we will. And so all of your sisters and brothers here in the United States are happy to have you and are happy to be part of this group. God bless. So that was so moving. And your words are really precious to us. Thank you. So that finishes the world tour. So we're back to the UK and we're back to Leeds. And now I'm going to hand over to Mary, who's going to introduce Joan, our guest. You remember Joan, who energized us so strongly last year. I know we're not going to be disappointed. So over to you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Um, I am not certain that Joan isn't here with Gail. I don't know if we can identify her. It's a big surprise to me to see you here, Joan and Gail, if you are here. And we'd love to say hello. But it is some small hour of the morning with you and you may not have your makeup on. So <laughs> we don't care. <laughs> Let, let me just say, please, that um, it is my proudest duty this weekend to introduce the theologian who's perhaps best known by Catholics the world over for her amazing talks and writings and thoughts and analyses. She's the author of more than 60 books of the Monastery of the Heart, hundreds of articles. She is besieged to speak about peace and human rights and women and church reform. She cannot begin to answer the, the requests that flood in for her to speak. We were so fortunate that she spoke for Spirit Unbounded last year and just blew us away. Blew us away with her clarity of vision and her strength of purpose. So we were even more blessed when she agreed to come back here by Zoom this year. I had been delicately negotiating for months to arrange the recording with her. And finally in July, I reluctantly mentioned that my August was going to be difficult as I was expecting a grandchild who would need heart surgery at birth. Instantly, an email flew back at me and it said, this is Joan answering you. I want to tell you that your daughter-in-law and this strong new little baby will be on our community prayer list till we hear what God is asking of us now. I am waiting anxiously now for all of you, but our hearts will be there with you. I can't begin to tell you how those words, that instant faith and commitment and love, from the other side of the world, that instant response from the heart has sustained me over these last eight weeks. I have literally never felt such blessing. And I think this is empowerment speaking. So welcome to Joan on empowering ourselves to flourish and thrive. Hello, all the roots and branches on the globe. We need you. We need the empowerment and the power you bring. And I'd like to take a few minutes today to talk to you about those dimensions and the way we are dealing in the church and out of it at the same time. So I'm going to open with a quotation from a premier philosopher of the fifth century, Boethius. 
Boethius taught the world of his time something very important, I think, for our time. He said, every age that is dying, and he said it in the midst of a declining Roman Empire, every age that is dying is simply another age coming to life. What's the point? The point is, change is new life. It's not death. Change is growth, not decline. And change is evolutionary, not revolutionary. And a Zen master from a, another culture entirely wrote in a similar period of history, no seed ever sees the flower. Point. We're all meant to begin things roots and branches that will grow tomorrow for us, that will only come to fullness of fruit after us. Despair, you mean to say in your heart, despair, that story taught me, can be found in every situation, however much good is in it, or even how much bad may also be there. It all depends on what we're looking for. In a Taoist tale, an old Chinese peasant had only one son and one fine white stallion with which to farm his land. So all the other farmers in the valley pitied him for his poverty, especially when they realized that his son had fallen off the horse and the horse was crippled. But the old man said, very simply, ah, good event, bad event, who knows? Then one day in fall, just at the beginning of the harvest, the local warlord, rode into that valley and conscripted into his army every young man there, with one exception, the crippled, limpy, apparently useless son of the old farmer, which the warlord left behind. The other farmers in the valley wailed in despair for them. But the old man said simply, good event, bad event, who knows? And that night, the white horse thundered down the mountain again with a herd of wild horses that it led into their corral. And as the, the farmers around cheered, the old man said simply, good event. That end, who knows? The point is that we all live in a good event, bad event time, which we must make the best of when one age is dying and a new one is coming to life. We are the seeds that will not see the flower. We are the tree and its weak but budding branches. The only question is whether or not in our time we will see reality as a reason to despair or as the very new foundation for new hope. Will we ourselves empower our own world our own timid soul, to realize that it is what we grow within us that will create the world that is coming. When we refuse to realize our own role in the growing of God's world today, if we stand by waiting for others to empower the weak, 
With what power will we ourselves grow the world we're in? The Garden of Eden, we have been given to seed and empower ourselves. And scripture is clear about it. Scripture says, the fact is that the history of God's way with the people of God has always been a good event, bad event, an ongoing affirmation of all life. In fact, that's the only reason we're here. We are the children of a long biblical history, steeped in despair and searching for hope in the bad events that we ourselves must turn to good. Remember, for instance, the enslavement of God's people by power-hungry pharaohs who led those people to despair. But it came Moses with the courage to defy those who ignored the needy. Remember that under siege, the Petholians contemplated surrender. But along came Judith, who went into the camp of the evil king and outwitted him by her own designs. The queen, Esther, the only Jewess in the harem, used her power to beg for the lives of all the Jews. And so, by her power, she empowered them all. When Jacob's brothers abandoned him in a dry well, he rose up to save the lives of those who had endangered his own. You see? In all these global cases, the people thrived and the future was saved for the entire people of God as well as for those who had faced the pain of it. When astrologers predicted the birth of a child foretold by a star, they followed that child's star despite the dictator's of this world who had set out to destroy them. And then came Jesus, who raised up women, a sign to women everywhere of what it feels like to be taken into the community at large. These are the stories of power and empowerment that we are meant to live by. We must stand up for the sake of empowering others as God created us to be. The whole Christian life is about claiming our own godly power so that everyone around us may be empowered as well. It is that kind of history that is now our legacy in this good event, bad event period of both church and state. It is this that is ours to redeem from the forces of elitism and clericalism and sexism in a church that is only 3% clergy and is now 97% laity, whose understandings and insights are empowered in them by God for that purpose everywhere. The question is, how do we know the good from the bad? If you're any kind of church watcher at all, you do know that for Catholics, life's been good, not good now, for a long, long time. The brave decision of the bishops of the world 
to bring the church into the 20th century in Vatican II, 400 years after Trent, and more necessary than ever, was good. But the response this time to synodality is being delayed by a few bishops in the system here who fear loss of privilege and are seeking power for themselves more than they value spiritual gain for the many. In fact, they elected three popes after Vatican II deliberately to smother and squelch Vatican II, John Paul II, Benedict Ratzinger, but now too, Francis. And the power of God is alive again this time to be empowered in us. In the name of reform, there is still among us a move to defy who are the real carriers of the church, the clerics, the hierarchs, the male. Is this our new synodal church? And who are the ecclesiastical lower class again? The laity, the women, the gays, the trans, those that they can count on, they think, to be silent, be simple, be spiritless, like you and I when we're weak and hiding, as in, ah, who cares? And who's listening? And so what? There is even a move to desire passive congregations to dynamic communities. And that way, to dampen the very spirit of the church itself, to dampen the presence of the laity. It is a move to put out the Pentecost fire, to make political, ecclesiastical power more important than spiritual leadership, while the people search elsewhere for the spiritual life they're seeking. And yet the fact is that great good has really happened in our time. In our time, we have learned that the church is the people of God, not simply a gathering of hierarchs around an even higher hierarchy. Instead, we knew now that we were it, and we thought they meant it, and that was good. But there was a bad event embedded in the Great Awakening as well. There was the question of whose church it really is again when the great doors close. And answers are given to questions they have already refused to answer at all. And then, and now, this is where we come in. It's we now who must take the church back, who must empower the 97% of the baptized who are the church who ourselves stand up, claim our empowerment, and empower it again. Oh, no, no, no doubt about it. Vatican II gave us the right to be the church. And to be real, we must do again then what we did at baptism. If these bad events are ever to become good ones, we must claim it, empower it, make it so. 
and at very least refuse to let the ideas die, or it will take another 400 years again to legitimate even asking them those questions again. The law itself is not enough. It is the model of the life of Jesus that must be the measure of us, of the church, of this time. Vatican II gives you and I the right, no, sorry, no correction, not the right. Vatican II gives you and I the responsibility in the light of Scripture to bring the church to life again in these 500 years of our silence since Trent. That's the power of the church given to us. And so that is the obligation of the empowerment of us all to bring it to life again. That is your obligation and mine to stand up, speak out, and speak on until the church itself has risen again. That is what power and empowerment is really all about. We have to stop away from it, claiming our false humility, our childish crying for someone else to save us, where both power and empowerment will die, and the church with it. You see, now, it is your name they're waiting for now. Indeed, Vatican II gave Catholic laity the right and responsibility to be heard in a world begging to be heard on every level. That the role of the laity in the church was even an issue at Vatican II may be the greatest turning point of the church in modern history. For the first time in history, the lay state in the church began to be described as a vocation. It was your vocation. It was a special call, an important role in the development of the church itself with the power of the church redeemed by the empowerment of the faithful. Then the laity began to see themselves more as seekers in search than as sheep in a sheep hole. If anything is going to change the church in years to come, if we mean what they said about motherhood as the cradle that rocks the church and the passing on of the faith, remember, remember this. It will be women, remember, who will empower the next generation to come. The point is, indeed, that it is your name they're waiting for now. The one right under Moses and Judith, Esther and Jacob, mothers and fathers, and Jesus. And Jesus. You are the voice of today's church. Speak loudly. You are the fire of today's church. Burn brightly. You are the hope of the church now and for centuries to come. Let that faith impel you. Let that love 
direct you. And let hope be the glue that binds you and your eternally enduring Pentecostal power and Pentecostal empowerment. You are the good event of the church in a bad event time. This is no time for despair. And this is certainly no time to stop. This here, today, now, in you, is the coming of the season of new hope and new empowerment everywhere, and new power in each of us to put down our fears, to refuse our hiding places, and for the future, for all our sakes, speak on, hope on, burn on, for all our sakes, go on. How? It's simple. As you, the power of the church, and you, the empowerment of the faithful, realize that every age that is dying is simply a new age coming to life. Rise up. Resurrect it. So that the children of the church may become its prophets, its martyrs, if necessary, its future, always. God bless you. Indeed, God bless you. Amen. Thank you for being that church for all our sakes. Amen. I don't know how to be able to thank Joan for that. I'm just going to throw into the room that it's easy to forget that in 2001, she was threatened with excommunication by the Vatican as she prepared to attend the first Women's Ordination Worldwide Conference in Dublin. To the Reform World's astonishment, she and her community stood their ground and the Vatican backed down. But even as late as 2019, she found herself disinvited from speaking at a Catholic education conference in Australia over her liberal views. She has found herself on the sharp end of the church's dismissive bullying, recognised it for the hollow sham that it is, batted it away. So let's treasure her words. Joan, you are what you spoke of. You are a prophet. And I think every one of us here will remember her words to us. The point is indeed that it is your name they are waiting for now. The one right under Moses and Judith and Esther and Jacob, mothers and fathers and Jesus. And Jesus. You are the voice of today's church. Speak loudly. Joan, thank you.